Okay, so that means we are down to the last video. We got five randoms left plus sound euphonium season three. So let's see what we get as our first random of this last video of our last five. It's going to be three, which is a condition called love. I heard this one was not particularly good. Um, have, uh, I could have, I could say that about a lot of shows that I finished. Uh, so let's, let's see what it's about. You know, I've never, it's been a while since I've been weirded out by a rom-com. Uh, it's been, it's been a hot minute since that happened, but the main dude in A Condition Called Love is creepy in a way that's not it's not like anime creepy it's like what the fuck like, this guy is very cl very clearly has some like uh let's call them not quite fully formed ideas about what love is and so he thinks it appears that anyone he thinks is nice to him is his soulmate. Um, he gets broken up with by someone, and then he's, like, sitting all depressed on a bench, and our main girl, whose name... I can't even remember their names. Our main girl, like, puts an umbrella over him because it's snowing, and she's like, hey, y'all right there? And he just falls in love with her. And then he just starts obsessing over her and, like, trying, constantly trying to win her over. And, like, the thing that, like, really got me, like, what the fuck is going on here? Is, like, he goes looking for one of her hairpins that someone else lost in the middle of a field, school field at night while it's snowing that is insane behavior girl run <laughs> uh, it's so and you know what I might have actually been able to buy into this initial premise if not for the fact that this dude is completely void of charisma. This dude is fucking rizless. He is so goddamn boring and substanceless. There's there's nothing there for someone to fall in love with. And the way that some of these shots are being framed, I got a little bit over halfway through the first episode. It looks like she's starting to fall for him, and I'm like... What the f or not not starting to fall for him, but at least like starting to show like interest in him or it's it's weird, man. This show's weird. Like, and it he cuts his hair because he completely miss. She says she says that she prefers having short hair because it's easier to wash. So he decides to cut his hair short because he thought she liked short hair on guys? That's fucking weird. That's really fucking weird. Ugh. It's- this show's weird. And you know what? It's not terrible looking either, but it's not- incredible looking either. It's just right down the middle of the road of being passable. What the story ain't. The story's fucking weird. Okay. Condition called love off the list. Four to go. What is next? One. Okay. Kaiju number eight. This is probably the last one on the list that I'm fairly positive I'll finish besides UFO. Although I'm not sure, because I've been kind of iffy on the manga as of late, but I'm sure this 
this first season isn't getting anywhere near where I am in the manga now. Uh, let, let's watch some kaiju battles. Well, this is a bit of a surprise. A little bit embarrassing after that declaration I just made, but, uh... I gave it the old college try. Um, I got three episodes into, um, Kaiju number eight, and I'm just not feeling it, which I could also say about the manga that at this point as well, like, I've been reading the manga since it came out, and I really loved the manga when it came out, because it felt, it just felt kind of fresh, and now... With the manga, it's feeling kind of stale. I'm like 70-ish chapters in. Um, so like nine volumes, I think. Uh, but the anime specifically, like... It just feels so... Basic. And like, I, I should probably give it like more... Now here's, here's the thing. I know where the manga goes. So... I don't have to give it more time to develop. I know what happens, and I know what's going to happen. On a character level, is not all that interesting. These characters do not go in interesting places. They are incredibly basic military soldier um, plot lines. <gasps> there is... There's, you, based on what I just said, you could probably predict a lot of what happens in this show. Except the fact that not a lot of people die. Like, not a lot of main characters die. In fact, I can only recall one n named character dying in the nine volumes of this manga that I read. Um, so, so, knowing that... What I have left from this series is A, the chemistry between the characters, and B, the action. Now, the chemistry is fine, but nothing to write home about. It is very, again, very basic military action comedy kind of stuff. Um, there is something about Kaiju number eight that has always felt a little bit, has always felt very western to me. Um, which makes it a little more on the nose when you have fucking Youngblood and the New Republic doing the OP and ED. So I guess they, they're really tapping into the American market for it. Um, the ED fucking sucks, by the way. It's so bland. Um. And. I just don't find the Americanized version of kaiju stories to be very interesting. I'm not saying this is an American kaiju story. There are definitely a lot of very obviously anime elements to it. But. This is one of the more western big value anime properties that I've seen. Um, and when it comes to monster movie stuff, I don't particularly enjoy the American perspective on it. I think it's typically very boring. Um, which is a shame because Kafka, our main character, kind of starts off as a very interesting character. He is uh, 32 years old, which means that he is only a year older than I am right now. Uh, so, on the one hand, that's like, okay, this is... And they do make kind of a big deal about it, about him being a little older. The, a lot of people refer, refer to him as old man. And, like, it's his age is starting to catch up to him in terms of his physical abilities. Um, so, that's interesting stuff to see. But I know where the story goes because I read the manga, and that becomes entirely irrelevant for the rest of the story. It's the, It does not matter. Once he starts actually using his kaiju powers more, it does not matter that he is a slightly older character. 
it's just kind of a foot in the door kind of thing to make him a little bit more interesting and then it just never comes up again at least as far as I've read um, so then there's the fights which are good in the end. they're good they're not mind-blowing like the first few volumes of the manga were to me like I the manga what really hooked me about it was the fights like they, the first few volumes had some really damn good fights um, but as the characters became less and less interesting um, the fights just felt started to feel kind of hollow and I have a feeling that I'm that's what's gonna happen with this one except that the fights aren't quite as good as they are in the manga they're still these they're still good fights but uh, nothing that's going to not this this would not make like my top 10 fights of the year list from what I've seen so far not even like top 20 probably um, and the character designs feel real wonky in this anime um, they they just don't lo they look a little good a lot of the time like the they get a little bit of that slack jawed anime face if you know what I'm talking about and also like and they get a little bit of that and then they they get a little bit of the like, thousand yard stareish um, wonky eye animation a lot of the time. Uh, which is a shame. I was hoping Studio Kara would put up a much better showing in terms of like the crispness and cleanness of the animation. Although this is definitely a Studio Kara color palette. I can say that much. Which I'm not going to say whether that's a positive or a negative. I think it's kind of a neutral here. It, I think it fits the series well. But it's not something I would have picked, personally. No, I'm being a little too hard on it. The color palette's fine. I'm just having flashbacks to Ava 3.0, where it looked fucking disgusting. Um, but, yeah, ultimately, with Kaiju number 8, this just feels a little too basic for me. It's, and... The fact that I know it's not going to get more interesting doesn't makes me want to kind of just give up because I'm not su I'm not like completely blown away by the production. It's just it's above average, but it's not like wowing me to any degree. Uh So, yeah. That's a shame. Just to offer a quick correction, apparently it was Production IG that did the animation for this. Kara was actually a producer for it, which is weird, but just wanted to offer that correction. Um, but anyway, uh, Gaiju number eight, unfortunately, coming off the list. So now we got three randoms left. Let's see what we roll next. Three. The Many Sides of Voice Actor Radio. Okay. Uh, I heard this one had some, like, slight, slight Yuri subtext to it. I'm about that. Let's see if, let's see if it's good. Okay. Not bad. Not bad. Just watched all of The Many Sides of Voice Actor Radio. Uh... Decent time. Um, this is one of those shows where it's like, it kind of survives on heart, if you know what I mean. Uh, it's, it is a, this is a very earnest show about the, a little bit about the craft of voice acting, a little bit about the culture of voice acting, kind of just everything together in a very earnest story that's not especially well written and not especially well uh, animated 
And honestly, not even especially well acted. That was probably my biggest gripe with the show, is that the acting isn't phenomenal, I guess. Which, I guess you could say is, like, sort of the point, because these are two fairly new voice actresses, at least in terms of the context of the show. I forget who the main characters are. I know one of them played uh, Miku in Quintuplets. I can't remember which one it was. Uh, so the two leads are not new voice actresses. Um, they do... They're not... Again, it's not bad acting by any stretch. It's just not to, like... For a show about voice acting, I was hoping for a little more impressive voice acting, I guess. Although, with the exception with the exception of the final episode, where it's just a straight read of a scene um, that um, Yasumi does. I'm going to get these character names mixed up a lot because they have their like real names and then they have their voice actress names. Um, so Yasumi, the Gyaru girl, um, her final read in the final episode for this anime that she's acting in, um, that was some phenomenal voice acting. Like, that was really, like, really damn good stuff. And I think the fact that it was just, like, completely silent except for the voice acting, and then you have, like, the, the key animation on screen, uh... And it's just silent except for the voice acting. That was a really good effect. Really cool idea. Um, so yeah, I definitely appreciated that voice acting. And again, it's not like super incompetent voice acting to any degree. But it's just not... Overall, it's not hugely impressive like I would have wanted it to. But you know what? It's competent. Um... For the most part, the whole, the entire package I would describe as, like, competent. Competent with a lot of heart to it. You really, they really do a good job of making, of bringing the, um, very complicated emotions of these two young voice actresses to the forefront and seeing those emotions and personalities clash, um, and evolve over the course of the series was very entertaining and endearing um I, I actually do like both of our leads a lot um they're just I do it's a really uh I think they nailed the rivalry elements between Yasumi and uh um what's the other one's the vo the other one's voice actress name is y Yuri I think and her real name is Watanabe Okay, and I'm, I've been getting, I feel like I've been getting worse with names over the course of this wrap-up show, perhaps because I've just been binging so much anime constantly. <laughs> um, but yes, this, we've got the, the, um, Genki Gyaru type contrasted against the very, like, cool and reserved, uh, girl. It's a pretty... Pretty common, almost stereotypical, like, rivalry kind of trope. But it, it works well, and I think the, uh, yeah, they just do the rivalry really well. And who knows, maybe the acting is just, like, what it needed to be to get, to bring that to the forefront. Um, but yeah, I, I was not... Well, no, there were some points where I was disappointed in, with some of the stuff, just because, like, uh, the second, the second arc in particular, the climax of that was real, it had real and then everyone clapped energy to it, that's all, that's the only way I can describe it, is, like, it was totally 100% implausible and very cheesy in how it was, uh, resolved. Um, but I do understand, like, a lot of the emotions at play in it. It's, like, that's the part where one of the, what, like, Watanabe is, like, a 
apartment gets doxxed online and so her mom like gets scared for her safety and is like, no, you're going to quit voice acting now. Which, you know what? Valid point, kind of. Like, it's real, it's hard, it, she kind of came up with a v incredibly valid argument logically and so like, they didn't even bother trying to fight the argument logically because they were like, no, no, you got a point. But we still have to prove to you that we need to, that we want her to keep voice acting. Um, so, the conflict behind that arc I thought was really good. Um, just the, the cheesy walk to the station amongst a crowd of fans thing, whatever their plan was, just uh, a bit um, implausible. More than a bit, I would say. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just a... Aside from that, I feel like the overall stretch of the story was pretty solid. I did. I think I liked the last arc of it the best because it really... It finally dug into, like, uh, her working as a voice actress and, like, the artistic drive behind that. I do like that our that um Yasumi is not like she's got she's got a little bit of savant in her but she just really doesn't know how to unlock it all the time and so most of her perform and so she's just kind of a struggling voice actress for the most part and they do a pretty good job of like conveying that she's not the best but she has the talent for it uh in contrast to um, Watanabe, who is just, who is actually a really good voice actress. And so the, the treatment of them in the show, I thought was really, uh, appropriate and a bit more realistic than like the, more of a like, oh, she's like the best voice actress ever and she's so young, some kind of, something like that. Uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, honestly, I'm kind of running out of things to talk about with the story because it's, uh, oh, there's a, this is legitimately a Yuri bait kind of show. Uh, there is a lot of that crowbarred in, like, it's like, I got two episodes into the series, I'm like, alright, this is kind of fun, voice acting, adventures kind of stuff, and then, like, episode three, it's like, what the... They're in the bath together, and Watanabe is groping Yasumi's tits. I'm like, what? How the fuck did we get here? Um. So yes, it is a this is a very Yuri Beatty kind of show in not a lot of great ways. Sometimes in pretty decent ways, but more often than not, it's real tacky and not great. Um. So, yeah, that's the, and it's like, they even, like, lampshade it in the show, too, like, when they, because they, these two characters work on, like, a voice acting radio show together, and so at one point in the show, they literally mention Yuri Bait, I'm like, uh-huh, that's the thing that you're doing, you get, you, you don't get points for lampshading it, uh, oh well, it's fine. Just like the visuals. They're fine. The I really, really like Watanabe's design. That is just one of my favorite types of design, I guess. Um and the this is not it's it's fine. There's nothing incredible about the voice about the visuals. Um it I would say they're kind overall a bit mediocre but it's fine it's fi I actually have very little to say about the visuals because there's kind of not a lot there it's competently shot I'll say that much there wasn't a lot of like compositing issues there wasn't a lot of like bad mixing of art design and stuff it's just not a particularly impressive production uh, so yeah it's a okay show. I was not planning, this is another one that I really wasn't planning on finishing, but you know what? 
it has uh, just a, just enough stuff in it to keep me engaged all the way through. There were definitely points where I was like, do I even want to finish this one? Uh, especially in around that second arc. Um, but, yeah, it was a fine time. Okay, many sides of voice actor radio is complete. I'm going to scroll not particularly far up the list, but we're going to put you in the number 28 spot with a decent six. Very earnest show that's not particularly well presented most of the time, but uh, earnest gets you points in my book. Okay, down to our last two randoms. Um, yeah, sure, might as well pull up the random number generator one last time and see what we get. It's going to be up one first. Didn't even need to pull it up. God's game we play. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely nothing about this one. Um, probably going to some be some kind of weird supernatural game thing. Who knows? Or it could be something entirely different. Let's find out. You know, there is such a thing as not enough exposition. Not in the sense of be making the audience too confused, but more in the sense of getting the audience interested in what the fuck you're trying to tell, tell them this show's about. Like, I got, I'm nine and a half minutes in to God's game, we play, whatever, and I have no concept of how this world works at all. Supposedly gods challenge humans to games or something, but I don't know what the consequences of those are. They say that the gods are like capable of destroying humanity, but they don't. What does that entail? Just annihilation? Does that in like just completely wiping out the entire planet? A continent? What does this look like? What are the stakes? And also, there's like such a contrast between like the games that we are supposedly seeing on like on TV, which are just just looks like a fantasy anime battle. There's no context to it whatsoever. And then it cuts to, now they're just going to play, the main character is going to play memory with this god as like a self-introduction kind of game. It's a neat idea, but like what do those, what does this have to do with the other things that just happened? There's no through line there whatsoever. Um, also, these characters are incre incredibly fucking bland and have no personality whatsoever. They are giant chunks of wood spouting lines at each other. It is so boring and so mediocre looking. This look, this this looks like it could have been made in 2013 derogatory. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is bad. This is not good. Okay, God's Game We Play is off the list, which means our last non-end cap series is The New Gate. Again, I have absolutely no clue what this is about. Probably some kind of fantasy series or sci-fi series or both. Um, let's, let's find out. All right, one more isekai for the road, I guess. Um, and definitely a unique take on it, I guess. So imagine if they, if the show starts with the end of the Einkrad arc of SAL, like the first arc of SAL. It, uh, like, it's like, the new gate is a game. And then a bunch of people got trapped in it, and if you die for, in the game, you die for real. And then this, the opening scene is the guy, like, the Kirito play character, who everyone knows and thinks is totally cool. Um, 
I'm projecting a little bit there. Uh, beating the final boss. And then everyone logs out. He, For some reason, he waits for everyone to log out. I don't know why. That's kind of a stupid thing to do. What would you do if they didn't? Um, and then he tries to log out himself. And then he just gets isekai'd to an actual fantasy world. But it still has works on the game mechanics. So presumably it is just... It turned from... It started as Sword Art Online, and now it's become Log Horizon. Uh, so that's happened. Um, but, like, when he realizes that he can't log out once he gets isekai he's only, like, mildly panicked. I would be fucking furious and immensely panicked if, sud if I beat this death game all by myself and then I'm the only one that doesn't get logged out. I would be fucking pissed off. And where where's where is any of that emotion? It's so lame and bland. And God this looks like shit. This show looks fucking terrible. The color design sucks ass. It's like way too blue toned, kind of. And it just looks funky as shit. The character designs suck. The action's terrible. It's a bad, it's a bad, bad show. This is why we have the bell for the isekai, because it's fun to make fun of them. Um, and they, sh they should stop making garbage like this. This is trash. Again. I guess I'm one to talk, considering that I watched all of Remonster, but this just this isn't fun like that show. So, fuck it. All right, Newgate off the list, which means we're finally down to the last show of the spring season, Sound Euphonium season three. I am definitely a fan of this franchise, but it's never quite made it into my favorites, except for Liz and the Bluebird. Um, so let's see if the ending to the story manages to bring it up towards the top. Alright, we are now three for three on really good music drama anime. Sorry, I I, w I wasn't expecting to be crying at the end of that, but I, I did. Um, yeah, I just watched, just finished up all of uh, Sound Euphonium Season 3. Man, it's, it's been a journey, man. I first started watching, I was still in college when this show first came out in 2015. It's been not it's been nine years with this franchise and even after all that time like that the final episode hit and it started playing and I was immediately beset with the panic of oh god I don't want it to be over <laughs> like and it's like I mentioned uh, a little earlier that uh, UFO has never been like a like a favorite favorite for me except for um uh Liz and the Bluebird. I think this season might have changed that because like not only is it just more really good UFO, but it just so near perfectly builds on everything that's come before, both in terms of like characterization in terms of character relationships in terms of like the desires and ambitions of everyone involved even in terms of like plot devices like the audition off like the the audition duel even that comes back full circle just everything that this last season just drew on everything that's been established before to perfect near perfectly 
encapsulate what makes this show great and so like give a final send off to these characters. Um, initially, I was a little not not put off, but thrown off by how this season was kind of structured because like the first two seasons. It's a lot more like, uh, like a, each half of each season has like a, here's a problem, we're going to address this problem. Next half, here's another problem, we're going to address that problem. And then season two, here's another problem, so on and so forth. So it's a lot more like arc, almost arc based in a certain, in a way. And... Season 3 just starts with, like, a bunch of episodic stuff, really. It's just sort of like, okay, here's this little problem over here, here's this little problem over here, here's this little problem over here. But, 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 in the background, you can see this tension building with our new character, Kuroe, um, who is... At first, when I saw, like, the key visuals for this season, I thought she was going to be another freshman, like Kanade was in the movie. Um, but no, she is a she is a transfer student, and she is a third year, just like uh, Kumiko is. Which, uh, as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, okay, I see where the drama and conflict is going to go this season. And it's go it was... And I was like, okay, this is gonna this is gonna be interesting. And boy was it interesting. It was I really there was just so much nuance and complexity in uh Kuroe's um character and how she kind of conflicts with the pre established um Kitaoji hierarchy um, despite the fact that Kumiko and everyone else are doing their best to integrate her into this hierarchy, but the fact that she is really fucking good upsets that hierarchy because it's sort of that expectation of, oh, of course Kumiko is going to be the first chair, um, euphonium player, but, uh, nope, that's not the case. Even at the very end, they kind of it. They threw in an upset. It was the, no plot ar no final plot armor for Kumiko in this one. That was very surprising, um, and also just the immense juicy melodrama of it all of having Reina unknowingly deliver the final vote that. Uh, gave the solo to Kuroe instead of Kumo, Kumiko. Um, that was just, and then the the retreat to their secret mountaintop uh, hideaway at the very end to vent their frustrations was just chef, fucking chef's kiss, man. This show, this show is so fucking good at melodrama. Again. It's Juki Hinata, so I think I've mentioned him at least three times across this season. Um, well, definitely twice now. This one and Girls Band Cry. I'm pretty sure he's come up at least one other place, but I don't remember where. Um, but, man, the drama is just so damn good. Especially the interpersonal drama amongst the, execu like the band executives as they try to, as they are finally put into a leadership position and they have to take their experiences of the past two years and put it into practice and try to change things for the better only for it to result in a kind of giant ball of chaos that really, that had the potential to completely set, to send everything completely careening off the rails, but because they managed to get over their particular hang-ups, they saw it through to the end. Um, God, this show is so... There's just... There's, I could talk about all the specific aspects of all the different, like, 
minute things that make this show great forever. There's just so there are just so many layers to the diff to the drama that has been built up for this season and just how it all uh comes together into this giant web of uh-oh, we have made a problem for ourselves. How do we get out of this? It's just all of these different coinciding things of, like, the... Like, we have the, um... Sh pure meritocracy of Kitaoji's audition system combined with the actual desires of the characters combined with the desires as the band as a whole. It's just good stuff, man. And... The... Yeah, the cast for this is just so fucking good. I ri this is we this really does feel like the end of Kumiko's journey to figure out what exactly she is trying to do here, which makes sense since she is a third year now and so she has to uh l figure out what she wants to do after high school, which eventually she comes to the realization that she wants to be a teacher, which, like, makes absolutely perfect sense with her as this president trying to just maintain order and just keep everything from completely falling apart between uh, surprise uh, audition takeovers and Reyna just being unnecessarily stubborn because she is Reyna. Um, <laughs> oh, well, while we're on that, I do want to, I do like that they left the, uh, the shipping dynamics of this show open at the end. Uh, because they're not entirely open. They're, this, sh this show has a, a tendency to be compulsorily het at times. <laughs> like, it's just, the we just have these incredibly intimate moments between Kumiko and Reina, and then it's like, don't forget, Reina's still crushing on the teacher, don't forget, Tsukamoto's still here, and it's like, okay, fine, whatever. But, they didn't do like a, here's where everyone is now, they, well, they briefly, they very, very briefly do that, but there's no, like, final ships at the end of this season, which I think was a good call, because now you can just leave it up for interpretation. Um, because I, you can only call someone a spe your special person so many times without the audience going, are they? <laughs> um, but yes, um... I will say, though, I think this is the first season where I actually really liked Tsukamoto as a character. Like, he wasn't bad before, but he did feel, like, tacked on in a lot of spots. Here, he actually, like, has a real purpose in terms of, like, being the opposite extreme of Reina, where he's trying to maintain where he is he is fully aware of the feelings of the other bandmates and how they kind of want to cling to the hierarchy a little bit, and so he's like on that side of it as opposed to Reyna's pure meritocracy standpoint. Um, so, congrats on finally figuring out something to do with him <laughs> at the end of the show. Uh, they finally did it. Um, yes, I just... Incredible characterization all around. I like the way that they use the alumni throughout this season, whether it's uh, Asuka, Kumiko crying to Asuka, basically being like, what the hell should I do? And she's like, the fuck are you asking me for? And then just kind of throwing everything back in Kumiko's face that she should have been able to realize this whole time, but it had to be put into words for her. Um, because Asuka is just like that. Um, and the Mizore had one of my favorite moments in the, from the alumni this season, actually, where she's like, where Kumiko's like, Do you, should I 
what would you think if I came to your school as a music student? And she, Mizari's like, I don't know, I can't even picture you being here, hon. <laughs> Which was like the final nail in the coffin of like Kumiko finally de trying to decide whether or not she should go for music or not, which I, I like I like that they gave that line to Misere. Not not only for the pure bluntness of it, because that's what Misere will does, but also I just think it's just very f considering her arc in li in season two and in Liz and the Bluebird. I thought that was very appropriate for her to be like, no, you don't belong here. You belong somewhere else, Kumiko. So. Props to that. Um, yeah, I could just talk about... I could talk about every character in this show forever. How Sapphire has... Or Midori has... Kind of, like, grown up very suddenly, I guess. And she's just... She always just kind of felt almost mascot-y before... Um, but now she feels like a third year and is, like, very mature and taking, what's his name, Motomu, I think, under her wing. And whatever secret conversations that they've had, she seems to have handled it very well. Um, we have Kanade has really come into her own after her, like, devilish little ploys in the, in the movie that she de debuted in. Um, and now she's just fully, like, Kumiko's number one kohai. I really loved that turn for her. Um, yeah, I I could talk about every fucking character in this show forever. It's just so immensely well written and good, and I love it. Um, and I love how it looks, too. This show is leaps and bounds so much better than just about everything else I've seen this year. I This could very well be the best looking show that I've seen this year. Not the most, well, like both in terms of just raw, pure artwork and also like in terms of like cinema, just cinematic competence. It's not like, this is not a like super abstract artsy uh, balls to the wall cinematography kind of anime. This is a pure, grounded, by the books, really strong cinematic language kind of anime. Just very, very incredibly well shot and just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful in just about every moment. It's fucking, it's so fucking good. Um, the detail paid to the instruments, the how much of the story is conveyed through character acting and character animation, just the subtleties of the way that they cock their lips sometimes, the way they narrow their eyes. It's just so damn fucking good. I mean, it's Kyoto Animation. Of course, it's going to look good. And, like, this is the first full season of UFO post uh, Arson. So, um, they had the, uh, I believe, did Liz and the Bluebird come out after the Arson? I think it was, that was before, actually. No, that was before. The only, the first thing to come out after the Arson uh, from UFO was the Ensemble Contest OVA, which I talked about, I believe, in last year's summer season. And there are... So, now this... And it's also the first season, I believe, with that Naoko Yamada was not part of. Uh, this is all Tatsuya Ishihara, I believe, is who, they, who is directing this one. Um, and... It's still the it's still UFO, and you if you look if you look for the differences, you can find some differences here and there. But for the most part, um, it is still consistent with what's come before, at while also being its own beast and just real 
really leaning into some strong like background art and just really great scenery moments. It's it's it is UFO. I think this might could this be the best looking season of UFO? It could be. It definitely could be. Uh certainly one of one of the best looking parts of this show. Um, and also one of the best acted parts of this show, because, of course, I have to talk about the acting in this, because it's Tomoyo Kurosawa, again, um, with, as Kumiko, with perhaps, again, it's, it's been a little bit since I've seen the rest of UFO. It's been about a year or so. Um, but, uh, man she really pulls out all the stops for this for her kumiko in this season it's just the nuance of her acting and also the explosiveness and over the topness when it needs to be um it's just so damn good and shout out to chika anzai as well as reina um she is just really that you can just feel like the just like a burning sensation sometimes whenever she really leans into stuff. Um, fuck, man, this show is good. The even down to the nuances in the performances, like the blind audition, like you could definitely tell. Not definitely tell. You you have you had to like really be paying attention to see which. Um, which performance was better. And it even caught me off guard, guard at first because I was just leaning into my own personal preferences of what I thought was good. But then, like, when I pulled back and looked at it again, I was like, oh, yeah, that first one was better because there was a little bit of hesitation in Kumiko's performance. And so, yeah, it makes sense that they would go with Kuroe instead. Just... God, man, this show's so fucking good. Ah, and I can't believe it's over. It's... I felt, when I... As this show was wrapping up, I, it felt like it... All of the memories of me in my high school band came flooding back to me. Um, like, a little peek behind the curtain. I went to a extremely competitive marching band school we were we for a very long time um my high school was like if you've ever been to bands of america my high school i'm debating how much to dox myself here has been in finals there a lot and my Gen my year in particular, my class, had a lot of raw talent in it and a lot of potential. And so all of the years before us, we were constantly getting hyped up, I guess. And so we were so our year was supposed to be like the big, like the we were finally going to win, win again. Uh, and we ended up coming in seventh. <laughs> So, not quite like Kitaji, who finally got their gold ranking for their competition. Um, so, a little bit of satisfaction by proxy there, I guess, or whatever phrase you would use for that. Um, yeah. There was, but there was just so much about the finality of this season as it was wrapping up that reminded me of the finality of the final performances I had at my high school with my band. Um, and it just, it captured that element perfectly. And man, I wish there was more. There can't be more, obviously, because the story is, is over, over their high school career is over. But I, I really wish there was more. UFO is just so good. 
Okay, Sound Euphonium Season 3 is complete. And I spent a lot of time trying to figure out where to put this exactly. And I finally decided on putting it in the number 3 spot for the year with a light 9. God damn, that was good. And with that, we are finally done with the spring 2024 season. Now let's do a little bit of recap here. Uh, my expected minimum completed was 15, and my expected max maximum was 22. And if I did the math right, there are 17 from the spring season that I completed. So... A little bit more towards the minimum side. If I recall correctly, in the winter season, I was a bit more towards the maximum. Um, so, perhaps I was a little harsher on the spring season. Um, but also, I got another three favorites out of it. Uh, Haikyuu, The Dumpster Battle, UFO Season 3, and Delicious in Dungeon. And uh, Jellyfish Can't Swim uh, came pretty damn close. Um... I think it looks, just based on the score spread, there are a lot more highs in the spring season than there were in the winter, but there were also a lot more, like, mids. Like, a lot of, a lot more sixes, as opposed to, like, a lot of sevens. Um, so that's pretty interesting. Um, and in total, I think I finished, there are four movies on this list. So, four movies, and then, which mean, would mean 13 TV shows, because I don't think there are any, uh, what do you call them, web shorts or anything. Um, but yeah, that's it for the spring 2024 seasonal wrap-up show. Had a hell of a lot of fun with this one. Um, so, as for now, I'm going to start catching up on some backlogged, stuff because I have a lot to get through for new seasons of stuff coming up and then in based on and I think this video is coming out in about a month we will finally be diving into the summer season uh, I might mix up the formula for a little bit when I get there but for now my name is Ember, and I'll see you next time.